Good morning, you guys. Hey, so good to be back with you <laughs> once again. And tell us where you're from. We see Danny Deluxe. Hello, Danny. And we've got the Austrian Mountains. Hans, wow, you're a new member, right? Welcome. And Leon from Southern Maryland. This is awesome. Always good to see you guys. Well, listen, we're going to just dive right into things here. So, you know, this is... Uh, get rid of that boy okay it's mark sorry if i'm being a little discoordinated here this is mark silver and i'm in carmel california bringing you this special episode coming up here this is brought to you by our friends at bay photo and i wanted to show you some of their current specials you can get their books and albums for 30 percent off there's a code right here jared will put that in the uh, we'll put this link right in there this expires on the 13th take advantage of that order a book order an album you can also get today this expires 15% off on their wall displays. Get something made, you guys, and for your first order, you're always going to get 25% off. So, hey, that's what it's all about, is getting your work in print, on the wall, in a book, somewhere. Take advantage of it. A photo is sponsoring us. Support them. Support yourself. All right. Now, today, we're bringing back our friends, the one and only Bob Holmes and Andrea Johnson. These guys are amazing. Here's some of their work. Without further ado, here they are. Hey, you guys. I need to get rid of something here in the screen, and I'm going to just pop you guys right over here to this view. There we go. How are you guys? I'm Mark. Good morning. Good morning again, and it's always great to have you guys. You're This time you're back in Oregon, right? Yep. We're in rainy Portland. Rainy Portland. Not unusual, oh, right? Miserable. A miserable rainy day. Well, we're going to be talking about weather, right? So that's part of our... That's part of it. We're going to yeah. talk about inspiration and weather and... Andre, I think that's a great thing to talk about because it's such an important part of photography is observing what's going on with the weather, you know, and not going out when it's a bright, sunny day because that generally produces boring photos. So should we jump into some years right away? Should we bring those up? Sure. I mean, we can bounce back and forth. I bounce. have a little bit of everything. Okay. Let me uh, let me get you situated here with your. Okay. So I've got this first image. Let me get it set up better. There's some definite weather going on there. I love that. So tell us what you did here. I think we're looking at the horse we're coming looking, in uh, yeah, the that's, vineyard in the background. That is the horse. I'm yeah, gonna just so adjust it a little Bob bit. And I have both been super fortunate to return to the same locations with a lot of clients that are long term. So this was at a vineyard out in Walla Walla, Washington. And in the spring, they have really rapid transitions of weather. And um, we were actually both working on video and photography and this happened so quickly i was only able to get a few still frames off in time but what was magical is just how the wind and the dust and the clouds and everything was mirroring the energy that right. was happening at the point and i think it's important to as much as i hate waking up at 4 a.m and actually it's 3 30 a.m out in walla walla those times of year there's almost always something that happens during very early pre-dawn hours. Yeah. And you want to have a plan, but then be ready to be able to transition quickly and work with whatever's happening out there. So I just, I liked that natural movement. The horse was plowing the vineyards um, and it was getting ready before that happened um, and in position that it all just lined up. So just knowing a place and where there's potential is really important. And then you have to hope that you're ready for that magic. Yeah. Let's do one thing before we go on. There's quite a bit of an echo. Can you bring the microphone closer to where you guys are? Let's just see if we can. 
eliminate that a little bit. Uh, make sure. I, I want to make sure that your audio is actually coming through that okay. microphone and not through the laptop. Yep, that's it. Okay. If I, if you can bring it closer to where you guys are, that's going to sound better. Maybe even just hold it up. Yeah. There we go. Andrea, this I love the way you've got the light on the vineyards and the dark in the sky. You've got this massive contrast going on. Where was this again? This is at Cayuse, their vineyard out in Walla Walla, Washington. Oh, yeah. Much better so, audio, by actually, the way. Good. Yeah. So that that area dawn happens quite early at that time of year and in the summer it can just be more desert like very bright hot sunny days so you have a really small window of time at the early morning and late afternoon where you've got some of that magic happening yeah now do you use weather apps to see what's going on how do you how do you know what's going to happen yeah like i like i said it's Probably more consistency of being able to be on the same locations. Yeah, we we try to plan more there for the springtime because it's really fresher, more dramatic storms that come through. Um, but once you've traveled to a location, and most of our travels as well, you have to just be ready to to move with it. So, although we use the weather apps more often, I'll use that <laughs> Sun Seeker app. Where I'll know exactly where the sun rises yeah. on certain days, and I can plug it out all 365 days of the year. So certain times the sun might not hit that vineyard, um, in that location trees might be blocking it or part of the mountain. So you time that out with the conditions, and then just hope that you pick the right season and um, continue to go back and capture different variations. Yep. And our theme is again inspiration. So I find it's inspiring, you know, when you when you do have this kind of intense weather, right? It's 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 enough to get you up out of bed and go out and do something, right? I just like the energy of change, and you know, this is especially, I think, relevant right now. There's just so much just going on, and it's impossible for me not to have the weather affect my mood or affect how I see things. Um, it's yeah. too easy to get stuck in a rut or seeing things as they always are. When you can mix it up with any element like that, it just helps energize, I think, my own creative mind. Right on. And I respond to what's happening out there. Yeah. Okay, let's look at another one here. Let me get over there and see what we've got. So this is incredible horse with the steam coming off. Oh, is that coming out of his nostrils, right? Yeah, so this is actually a similar vineyard in November. Mm -hmm. um, so they actually plow over some of the canes to help protect it in the winter. And it's just frigidly cold. I think it was maybe in the upper 20s. So the horses are working hard. Their breath and condensation yeah. is showing with every step as they come out. So, I, you know, we really struggled trying to show this. We were doing photos and video. Um, Bob was shooting the video for this. Uh, we wanted to show the effort that the animal does in that work. And sometimes there's only certain seasons that you can visually make that read quickly with a particular image. So we had, you know, noticed that being close to the horses during different times of the year, but it really stood out at that particular um Frigid morning. You had a pretty long lens, right? Because it looks it looks like the background is kind of compressed there. Do you remember what that focal length was? Probably 200. Yeah, that's um, what I'm thinking. Double check. Let's see exactly what I was at. Um, it gives us the feeling oh, of only, uh, it's coming right only, out of the, the vineyard. There. I was only at 95 millimeters for that. What was it again? 95. 95, okay. Almost like a portrait lens. Okay. No, I was sorry. It was a 70 to 200 lens, and I was zoomed at 95. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. Here's another one. The deer, or the deer, the, the sheep in the rain, and I love the way you've got, you actually have the raindrops streaking through this. Yeah, so that, I mean, we can almost show, I'll talk briefly about this one and move on to the other. Um it was a very sudden downpour. Actually, Bob's video gear got pretty drenched, so he had to go in and switch out. And 
the backlighting before the rain started was fairly dramatic. And do you know when the sun's that low in the sky that yeah. you want to stay through the scene that you may get lucky and have a rainbow? So this is another vineyard for Cayuse that I've been working with for years and hoping for some type of drama that's going to happen. And I, I actually was caught myself without any rain gear out there for the shoot and was able to, to shelter the, the cameras well enough um, with some of the gear. And then the next one was just maybe 20 minutes afterwards, if you can switch to the rainbow shot. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, well, Same spot. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that I think it's important to add, you know, I'm not a gearhead, as you know, Mark. I do know that. Equipment doesn't really interest me. But the big advantage of professional cameras is very often they're weather sealed. <clears throat> you, right. you, won't see any, you won't see any difference in the results. The, the final photographs will look the same. But if you're caught in a downpour with a pro-level camera, the chances are it will survive because they have good weather sealing. And that's something you should always look at when you're buying your equipment. That's a good because point. Because otherwise you, miss, you can miss great shots. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is a fantastic. So, Andrea, that's in the exact same spot? Same. I just turned around 180, and actually I did have to run a bit. I wanted to get the animals in between the rainbow. Yeah. So I've been using a lot of the Nikon mirrorless um, gear. I think I had a Nikon D850 over one shoulder and a, I didn't even have my wide angled lens, which was terrible. I had a 24 to 70 on a Nikon Z7. Oh, wow. And obviously I couldn't fit the rainbow in it and I didn't have enough time to sprint back to where the rest of my gear was. So I, I think I stitched five different photos together vertically for that rainbow Ooh, shot to make it work. Um, and I only got one chance at that before the intensity. There's actually a slight double rainbow on top of it. Yeah, I see that. But animals were moving quickly. The light was moving super quickly. I was running through the field to get in the right position really quickly. So by having lightweight gear and being able to respond really fast, um, I think it's important to be able to be mobile yes. as well yes. here and if you have too much slogging you down um i mean i wish that i'd had the wide angle lens but then also knowing that if you overlap each photo at least a third of the way and you shoot quickly you're probably going to get it to line up with either lightroom or photoshop some good algorithms for panoramics yes so, another good reason to stay light and mobile right I mean, that's if you're lugging around bags of stuff and gear and whatnot, you're going to be bogged down with that. Well, why don't we switch it up, Bob? Let's let's look at some of yours now. Let me get you there. OK, so here's I'm assuming. Let me guess. Is this uh, Cuba? Uh, yes, I guess you. I'm looking at the same image. I hope the so. Guy on horseback. Yeah, the guy yeah, on horseback. Things, you know, after um, the last show we did, I was thinking about inspiration, and there are a couple of things that I should have mentioned then that I'll mention now. One is finding something that interests you and just work it. Right. You're in Cuba. There are a lot of horses. So I started shooting horses, and I'd use them in every kind of situation. Whenever I saw a horse, I'd try and make it work in the photograph. This happened to be in very similar light to the opening shot of Andreas, where it was a stormy day and suddenly there's a, a shaft of sunlight coming through. Yeah. You know, it's my favorite. It's all, all photographers' favorite kind of lighting. <clears throat> you, know, you get dark skies but sun in the foreground. And you know, we were on horseback going, I forget, but it's somewhere near Trinidad in the Sorry. Uh, not, Sorry to interrupt you, Bob, but you may want to hold the microphone just a yeah. little bit further away. There we go. Just yeah. a little too close. Is that too close? Yeah, that's a <laughs> sexy uh, radio voice. Okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, yeah, that should be better. Thanks, yeah. Jared. Um, yeah, it was in Vinales in western Cuba, and we we're, were on horseback ourselves, which gave me this much higher viewpoint, which worked very well. And I saw this tobacco farmer coming from the left, going past this old thatched hut, and it just made a great shot. Um, the important thing is to get, again, the gesture of the horse, yes. so its legs were apart, and it there was some feeling of movement there. 
but I continued shooting horses on this trip to Cuba. Um, Bob, you know, Bob, I don't think you should be shooting horses. I'm sorry. I, I have to chime in here and, you know, well, there, on behalf of the uh, equestrian population. There's still some butcher shops in Paris that uh, um. sell, sell the meat. Um, but oh. I, I did a whole series on horses. Uh, as you'll see, the, if you can go through the other shots, Jared, sure. fairly quickly. You we, were using the mirrorless here too, right? Having to shoot. I don't remember. Was this a, 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 and Bob, did you have that visualized ahead of time? You you thought when I go to Cuba, I'm going to especially look for horses. Well, no. You, there are, sometimes when I'm lacking inspiration, I will work with some. I used to shoot doing magazine stories. I used to shoot phone boxes quite often. You know, those are a thing of the past. Fun boxes? I've got a great archive of telephone boxes. Oh, phone boxes. Uh, that I always used to shoot and people on the phone there and making them part of the street scene. You know, it's, it's just a crutch to yeah. get, your, get your vision going. Um, you know, I mentioned on a uh, social media post this week that there are some days when you, you just don't see anything. You can go out and it's a complete wash. You know, the muse has gone away and you, you really have a problem seeing any photographs. And you wonder if you're ever going to be able to shoot again. It's an alarming feeling. It really and is. then there are other days when you go out and everything you see is great. And there's really no difference in the circumstances apart from inside your head. Um, this was one of the days, this guy on horseback against the green wall yeah. was one of those days where I was seeing photographs everywhere. I saw this guy coming. I'm really interested in color. I love the two blue posts yeah. and the green wall. Um, and just waited for all these elements to come together. It wasn't really pre-visualized, but I knew what I was after. I like I that it, crutch, though, Bob, of, of p picking, you know, like the telephone boxes or the, or the, the, the uh, guy on the horse or cars or whatever, and just using that as a kind of an inspiration point. Yeah, I think the next shot is of a horse as well. Um, we didn't even know we were about to yeah, this, shots. Look at this. Yeah, this, yeah. this is not far from the last shot. I just saw this and, and grabbed it. You know, I saw the, the again, a, I guess, a farmer standing by the horse with his hat on. That's so cool. And I just, I just love the juxtaposition of the shadow, his shadow on the white wall, and the horse's almost silhouette of the horse's head. I love that. And you're just bending the rules here, you know. It's just... Uh, you know, once again, well, it's 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 not about rules. It's about seeing what you see, right? Yeah, look, there are look, no rules looking and that. seeing. Yeah, oh, to hell with the rules. To hell yeah, with this it. is another shot. Yeah, the, I really it reminded me very much of a Cartier Bresson photograph. It does of the two prostitutes in Mexico? You know the photograph I mean? Uh, yes, I do. Wrong. They're ma very, very heavily wrong. made up, and and they're yeah. looking at the it. Window. Sort of has the sec the two women. Although they're not hookers, I assume. Um, two women looking out of from their house, yeah. and then the horse looking in the opposite direction. And I, I really like the juxtaposition of the two. Um, and again, it's to start with, they were looking at me. The two women looking at me, and that didn't work. Yeah. And I've got a whole series. I probably took ten or more shots of this, and. There's only one where the horse was in the right direction and the women were looking away. Something attracted them and they turned away and I got the shot. I think I got one frame that really worked. But again, it's the horse thing. Yeah. It's the horse that attracted me to it. So that was, it was the horse that provided me with the inspiration to keep shooting. Um, and these were all within, well, all, all apart from the first shot, they're all within a square, a square mile. All taken at the same so, time? More or less, or take the same two or three days. Yeah, yeah, isn't that or wonderful? Same, this area of a, a little town called Trinidad in Cuba, which is a fabulous little old colonial town, and it's packed with tourists. But the tourists go on the main drag. If you go half a mile off the main drag, you're completely on your own. And I, I used to go every day, I used to go to this area where you didn't see a single tourist. There's the odd photographer. Also discovered it, but yeah. um, it was you know, get away from the tourist hordes. 
And tour groups always stick, you know, they're always with their guides and they stick to very rigid paths. Yeah. One of the things we do with the workshops is we take place, people to places like this, away from the normal tourist drags. You know, when, when we go out, when everyone else is eating breakfast, we're out shooting. Yeah. And we eat this later or whatever. So that's a big beauty of uh, teaching workshops in places like this. By the way, do you guys have any scheduled coming up? We have two cancelled coming up. Uh, I guess. <laughs> we had one to Oaxaca for Day of the Dead, and we didn't want our, uh, our workshop members to be joining. Yeah, that. really. <laughs> and we had one to Cuba in December. Um, and we, unfortunately, Trinidad and Havana are closed to tourists. The only place you can go at the moment is to some of the resorts, which are big modern resorts full of Europeans and Canadians uh, and hold no interest whatsoever for normal travel photography, whatever that may be. Um, so we decided to postpone it and we're now looking into date in March for that. And the Oaxaca one we're doing in 2021 you know thinking out loud with you guys i don't know why we should organize a virtual workshop you know and we yeah we may why not P you know people can come and bring bring their images and we could do some critiquing or have yeah. assignments in their own area or something let's let's talk yeah. about that afterwards yeah we should think about doing that yeah absolutely. and that, that really that brings me to another thing that i was thinking about inspiration when i started getting really interested in photography, I joined the local photographic society. It was called Ilkeston Arts Club, which was a little group of painters and photographers in my hometown, which is only 30,000 population. Um, and there's some you know, keen amateur photographers. And then I joined the School Photographic Society. I was in my mid-teens at this time. Then I joined my College Photographic Society. Um, and, you know, it, it provided a lot of feedback. I should warn people if they do this, if they go that route, don't take it too seriously because a lot of yeah. photographic society members, all they're interested in is pleasing judges for monthly competitions. Right. And it destroys their own pers personal vision. You know, I, I'm asked to judge competitions occasionally although usually usually after i've judged one i'm never invited back because <laughs> i don't believe in pulling punches yeah if people are serious they should be able to take positive criticism or constructive criticism but i found it very valuable when i was a beginning photographer and i really enjoyed that sort of feedback from people who had similar interests and when I came to the States, a group of us used to get together every month to show our work and um, yeah, exchange ideas. Uh, and it was looking back on it, this was in the early 1980s. The group was, was pretty amazing. And we were all emerging photographers. Um, there wasn't a single established photographer in the group. There, there was one, Dewitt Jones. Dewitt Jones, um, yeah. Yeah, Dewitt was From probably San Francisco, only, San Francisco Gardens, too. No, do it went to uh, do it went to Dartmouth and then USC. Okay. He majored, he majored in drama at Dartmouth and then film at USC. But do it had been doing stuff for National Geographic, and he lived in Marin where I live, um, and we became very. In fact, we even started a business together, Holmes Jones and Morsey. Sounds like a firm of lawyers. Really. Uh, but that being photographers, that didn't last long. Um, but that group was amazing. Um, Galen Rao was part of the group. Franz Lanting. Oh, wow. George Steinmetz. Wow. George, who does incredible aerial photographs. Nick Nichols, who became uh, one of the major photographers at National Geographic. And I don't think any of us had had any formal training in photography. DeWitt was the closest studying film. But we're Amazing. all amateur photographers that were determined to make it as still photographers. Um, but it was incredibly energizing being a part of that group because that in itself provided the inspiration. Uh, you know, I think about six or eight of us that met at each other's house or office or whatever every month. And that was really exciting. And there's no reason why anyone shouldn't do that. 
I think that's reading. pretty amazing. The the results you the names you just mentioned are are luminaries, you know, in photography. Well, looking back, yeah, looking back on it, it was phenomenal, uh, and you never know. You know, it's, it wasn't entirely luck. The reason we got together was because we we all fed off each other. Uh, you know, Galen was starting to make a name. He got his first break with National Geographic because Dewitt had to turn an assignment down. And it was on the northwest face of Half Dome. They sent, I think it's the first ascent to the northwest face of Half Dome. Wow. And Dewitt didn't feel he was capable of covering it as a climber. And Galen obviously was. And it was Galen's first break with National Geographic. That's amazing. Uh, and then, you know, things continued from there. Yeah. And then Franz was really anxious to get into National Geographic, although it's difficult to believe now, looking, I know. you know, Franz is one of the finest wildlife photographers in the world. But he had a long, it was a long time before he was accepted by National Geographic. And he used to go over to DC and hang out. And I got geographic assignments before Franz did. And Franz used to say, you know, if you're going to do an animal assignment for geographic, make sure it's something that's big and doesn't move a lot. <laughs> and uh, it, it was for, for me, yeah, well, for anybody. Not an elephant. Exactly right because one of the assignments I got was to shoot a snow leopard research story in Western Nepal. And nobody had photographed a snow leopard at that time. And Fran said, Fran said, you know, that's, that's professional suicide. Yeah. Trying to shoot something on a geographic assignment that nobody's ever photographed before. Then, of course, I came back and I didn't get a photograph of a snow leopard. But fortunately, I got enough other decent stuff for it not to affect me too adversely. That's good. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but by meeting a group meeting together like that, you know, we, we all generated energy from each other. And so, you know, if you find a group of friends, get together and meet and show your work, even if you're not interested in becoming a professional photographer. Yeah. Our group were all intent on being professionals at a fairly high level. Very but, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I, I know groups of absolute amateur photographers that get together regularly and share their work and get increasingly better as photographers. You know, if I can maybe add something that, to that as well, with all the movements that are going on um, and causes that similarly minded people may believe in, I've been finding inspiration from other like-minded people to band together and help maybe showcase a light on underserved people or um, cultures or causes that might not otherwise have had a fresh eye. And by having an opportunity to bounce ideas together within a larger group and maybe some that aren't even photographers or other photographers, that common passion and common cause can also help break through um, a lag and in inspiration by just finding something that everyone's working towards. So true. Hey, well, no, hang on there, Andrea. Let's go back to you. We're going to switch off. We've heard we've heard quite enough of Bob. Uh, even the audi no, even the audience is asking for Andrea. So I, I think it's oh, go ahead. come on, get life audience. <laughs> now I've just got one thing I was going to say, Mark. You know, it's tempting. You know, in this idea of feeding off other photographers and getting this sort of camaraderie. There's a temptation for people to enter a lot of photographic competitions. I get invites almost every day from a, yeah. another photography competition. Be very wary. A lot of them are just scams to I make know. money. Uh, there are so many of them. And these, you know, it, it's good for your ego initially to win awards, but they're pretty meaningless. You know, I've got my fair share of awards and really it's, it, it doesn't mean much at all. You know, you just know how to pick something that judges will respond to. Yeah. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. All right. I just get really irritated with a lot of these competitions. The same with video. You know, there are so many. I know. There's, there's so many video, particularly, um, what do you call them, documentary festivals and things. Yeah. That we put and won awards at. But most of them are just money-making endeavors. I think you have to be passionate about the subject and what you want to be able to help bring more light to in the world. And then it's a different um, scenario yeah. that you're working hard 
towards something that is going to do a greater good. So let's go to your next. I've got the next one here. This looks like Japan. Waterfall. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. Ah, no, actually, that's Oregon. So Oregon, back to. Wow. Yeah, it's a, a surprise the order they'll come in, but that's all right. That works. Um, that was Multnomah Falls back in the day of. Um, gosh, I think this was early slide film. I should remember this. 2004. Um, slide film. Yeah, I think I scanned. No, actually. No, this was actually, this was one of the first digital Okay. as I was transitioning. Anyway, um, now you may see that scene photographed quite a bit, um, but back almost 16 years ago, when the gorge would freeze over, it was actually quite difficult to drive out to that location. I guess. And Multnomah Falls is one of the largest, tallest waterfalls in the United States probably one of the number one tourist destinations in Oregon. And it's really hard to show that in a different way, even back then. So um, I just pulled this image up to be able to showcase the importance of getting to iconic locations in very different weather. Yeah. You know, if I had a chance to shoot that now, there's a lot of different things that I would love to add to that image. But at that point in time, there weren't much, there wasn't many options that were similar out there just because the access was so difficult so i think you have to be willing to suffer a bit in a way to get to a place that's not as easy or a weather situation that's not as common so there can be a unique spin on a familiar scene yep all right is this same, probably not the same shot but you're shooting there's a whole series here that you uh, yeah, so this was this is when i almost died at this last January. Oh, wow. <laughs> Are we talking about the snowboard scenes now, starting to in the skiing? Yeah. Now I, I say that half joking, but um, I had an amazing opportunity. So I absolutely been passionate about um, aerial work for a long time and um, heli skiing and heli snowboarding. So this was my second chance to get up um, in Canada with CMH heli skiing. That was a private group. And I assumed I'd be photographing a lot from the helicopter um, because it's really rare just to have the one helicopter to a small group of seven um, skiers. I was the only boarder at this time. But it turned out there was just record, record, chest deep snow everywhere. That powder is incredible. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it was just flying over our heads every, every place to get to. Yeah. And so I ended up having to snowboard with my gear and, you know, follow these guys or go ahead of them or set up and wait for them to go past. And so my setup with, despite all the lenses that I rented, purchased, had ready for the helicopter um, and the larger, faster bodies, just these were amazing skiers. I I had to really pare down the system and I yeah. ended up going with the Nikon Z6 and a 24 to 70 for each one of these lenses. Um, and I had a little um, think tank. It's actually a mind shift bag. I don't yeah. know what photo you're on or if you've already gone by the one of myself yeah. with the, but you can wear it as a backpack, move very quickly, spin part of it around to open it up side access and be able to get the gear. So um, that made all the difference, just like the previous shots of the rainbow and other concepts that you're able to move really quickly and um, be able to trust that you can react to whatever weather situation is sent your way. So that last one, I think you're showing on the, the steepest section was the only time the sun started to break through at all. That's um, amazing. And it was like, uh, it was just pure bliss. It was an incredible, steep, long, deep um, trail. People got up quite a bit of speed. And as I followed right after that, there was an unexpected 30-foot cliff that I went off. But ah. <laughs> and so did I. And that's a, a story for a longer time, probably. Yeah. Let's take up uh, Sandy in India has a good question at this point. On global assignments, how a photographer copes with ever-changing weather and color of light. Let's switch back and forth. Uh, uh, hi, Sandy. You, I recognize your name. Um, I guess color of light is something that 
you just accept. You, I don't worry about it. You know, if you're shooting advertising photography and have to match your product, it's very different. But as documentary editorial photographers, it's not something that's of any great concern. You want the, and particularly shooting raw, if you shoot raw on a digital camera, you can always adjust it in Photoshop or Lightroom. So you have that ability to tweak light, tweak temperature to any way you want it afterwards. Yeah. So I don't worry too much about light generally. Um, as far as weather's concerned, again, you run, you don't have any choice. You have to be prepared for any kind of weather uh, and don't not go out just because the weather's bad. Bad weather, I think, is far more interesting than good weather. So we true. Up, we probably end up going out more in bad weather when we travel than when we do at home, where you have a tendency, if you're not on assignment, to get lazy. And um, when you're traveling, you only have X amount of time at a place, and you'll be at that scene no matter what. Remember in Czech Republic at the journalism conference, the torrential rain that hit us in the square. Mm. And one of the shots that also in Vietnam coming up, I don't know if we would have been out in those floods had it been at home necessarily. So it forces you to, to change. I think clothing is important too, that you're able to be comfortable enough and move around enough in extreme temperatures, um, lots of layers, and then bags that you can carry it in quickly and move in quickly and just be able to be on your feet for a long periods of time if that's what it necessitates. Yeah, Actually, clothing is very important because you tend not to think about it as a photographer necessarily, but you need to dress appropriately. You know, if you're wearing clothes that you don't care about, you much, you feel much less inhibited about lying down on the floor or kneeling down or, you know, tearing your clothing to get the shot than if you're wearing decent clothes. So, you know, I always wear clothing that is disposable to some extent and also weather appropriate clothing. If it's hot, wear something that's cool. If it's cold, make sure you wrapped up well. You don't want to stand there shivering. Uh, you'll get camera shake apart from anything else, but you, you want to be appropriately dressed so that nothing gets in the way of your concentration on the image that you're trying to capture. Anything yeah. that detracts from that is going to get in the way of the photograph. And I think that's so important because if you are limiting yourself in any way, you're going to miss photos. You're, if you can't lie down on the ground, you were talking about this once, Bob. If you yeah. can't lie down or your shoes are really uncomfortable or you're, you're overly hot or too cold or whatever, it's just, it just gets in the way. Yeah, it's, it's you know, one of the basic fundamentals of photography. You have to strip everything away that could get in the way of seeing that final image. That's Anything right. that distracts you from that is going to get in the way. It's like learning your equipment, knowing how your equipment works, uh, being totally familiar with it. Um, if you're not, then as soon as you have to start thinking about things, it's taking away some of that vision from the actual subject. And, and uh, adding clothing's an integral part of that. Adding on to that, uh, one thing I was thinking about too is it's not just always about um, your clothing because y you were talking about you got to have the clothing willing to get you know dirty and everything, but also with your equipment. If you're loaded down with a ton of equipment, there's no way that you're going to be able to you know get down on the ground if you've got three cameras you know around your neck and different things like that. Yeah, that is very, that's really true, Jared. In fact, I remember one assignment I did. I'd just switched systems. Um, I'd forgotten the exact circumstances. But basically, I had a very simple outfit, a, a couple of bodies and a couple of lenses. And it's one of the best shoots I've ever done because I didn't have to continually be thinking, you know, should I change this lens? Should I use some other equipment to get the shot. I had what I had and that was all I could use and it freed me up tremendously. I really like working with just a Leica and a 35mm lens. I love that. It's so freeing. 
Yeah, and I'm just going to, in talking about that same scenario, being able to be really comfortable as we're talking with travel and different locations and lighting, um, I think you want to be conscious of trying to blend in um, authentically as much as possible. So if you're in a culture where people are generally more covered up or if you're generally in a culture that is more dressy or more casual, that you are um, not standing out and in just insisting to, to wear what you may in other places. And I, I tend to use a lot of, um, I think for women it's easier to have a belt. Um, hips keep it up better and you can just grab things in and out of there. But you know, I'm often crouching, I'm laying down, I'm moving around in different spots. And if it's too heavy or too bulky or too hot or uncomfortable, you just, even if you stick it out all day, you lose part of the joy and fun of just experiencing what you are doing. And that your own personal energy is so important, I think, of keeping the inspiration up. So you need to make the experience enjoyable for yourself beyond just what you're shooting. Totally. Uh, Lorraine is saying, yes, keep it flexible. Why don't we do one more image from each of you guys, and then we'll just uh, pick up some questions. So, Andrea, I have this series with uh, the bee and the butterfly, and I think there's uh, – whoop, we'll go to the next one. You want to talk about these? Yeah. No, actually, this is really appropriate for the pandemic right now. I think there are times we all really need to slow down, and we all can reach a burnout stage. I think that the world was just spinning fairly quickly for – um, many different aspects and as we've had time at home and when I'm losing the opportunity maybe with the great landscape light or other activities I'll hone in really close on a particular subject that actually may not normally get the care or time that it deserves or needs so with these two series the bee and the butterfly the bee was technically much more difficult I had a 105 macro lens on and I just um, kind of got myself in an almost meditative state, um, relaxing, you're drinking in the smell of the lavender, which is lovely, yeah. and watching how the light hits it with the background and where the bees are attracted to. So you just fine tune an area that um, you can get in that focus and then get the shutter speed ready to be able to capture. And then I might hang out for an hour and a half until I get that one shot and just eliminating every other distraction around me and only focusing on that one thing slows down the crazy mind that we all are inundated with other things. So I, I find it really important during times like this pandemic to turn off news, social media, phones, um, get yeah. out in nature and just try to tackle something that's challenging that you wouldn't normally have time to do. And just, you really get into that moments and as I need to relax or come back to those things I'll, I'll pick a subject that helps me get into that state and then the next day I might be ready to get back out and do a regular variety of things but we need to take our own energy just as much into account for the inspiration as a subject and there's certain subjects that really help bring us to that spot that's great okay Bob we let's do one more of yours we we're ending uh, we had last one we had are the Two women and the horse. So we're out of the ones that you had provided, Bob, but I have a bunch of your photos over here because, you know, I've done so much editing of yours. And I found another one of your Trinidad ones that I, I thought would be interesting to look at because it's another one where it may not be as interesting of a picture without necessarily that horse that you've yeah. been using as inspiration. So I'd love to hear a bit more on, on this photo. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize you had that one. That's pretty uh, cool. Yeah, you know, I was, you know, I, I try to get as much information in photographs as I can. And I guess, you know, it's a sort of classic, classic National Geographic um, idea. Yeah. You, want, you want the photographs not only to be strong graphically, but also be full of information. And I love layers in photographs. I like to, you to be able to go back into them. And the, the, what I, I liked about this shot was the cross on the wall to show that there's still a strong religious element to Cuba, yeah. despite being a communist country. Um, 
religion is still taken seriously uh, among a sector of the population. I like the horse, but I wanted some other punctuation in the photograph or other point of interest and the bicycle and the color of the bicycle provided this. And I, there's also a dog. I don't know if you can see the dog. Uh, I have another photo with the dog. Let me get that up too. Yeah. Stick is there a dog in this one? I'm not seeing. I don't it. think in this one, but in this other one there is. You can't really see it. Yeah. Because this was more about the bicycle. Before we go to this, I want to just say, oh yeah, you know, Bob, you're breaking the rules here too. I love it because you know one of the generally kind of thought uh, assumed points of composition is only have one center of interest. And you don't just have one center of interest, as you say. You have a, you have photos within photos here because you have the bicycle, then you have the the guy on the horse, and even the cross has its own layer there. Yeah, you, know, you very often if a photograph is only one center of interest, it can be it can be almost be too simplistic. But this works. It, it, it works. Doesn't have any life. You know, uh, as I have often mentioned, one of my favorite photographers, Alex Webb. His yeah. photographs incredibly complex you can't really say there's one center of interest but yeah. i love that complexity no, it's that's very difficult it's very difficult to work with or in the field shooting to bring all these elements together yeah. and this particular scene i worked this for some time uh again it's in this square mile of trinidad away from the tourists now and there's the dog the horse the dog and yeah. I, I just kept working this scene and eventually the one of my favorite shots, there's a, a butcher bringing a cart full of meat. Oh, yes, I remember that one. Dropping the meat off. And I got him in the foreground yeah. with this cart of, of meat and all the other elements sort of going away. So it was really multi-layered. But, you know, I don't just take one or two shots. If I get inspired, um, then I'll keep working, keep working the scene yeah. until I get what I want. And one photograph is no better than the other, really. It's just a matter of personal taste. Why don't we take a couple of questions? Who's got a question out there? I love it that you guys are uh, joining us. Hi, Michelle and Jordan. Lorraine, big fan, right? Uh, I saw one back there earlier, Jared. I think it was about natural light that we were going to ask Bob. Yeah, uh, we had... Uh, I think it was Curious Mind. Um, they were wondering uh, if you guys had any tips for capturing natural light and travel photography. Um, so similar to the other question that we had earlier, but if you have anything that you'd like to elaborate on that. Well, not really. You know, natural light is what it says. It's natural light. Yeah. It's the light that's there. The only tip is to learn to look at light and how it affects subjects. And then when you see light that's particularly that you particularly like, find a subject to go with it. Uh, there are no tricks. Oh, we're uh, just getting ourselves in the position to be there with the good light. Yeah, you have to know where to be when, I guess. Andrea is correct in that respect. Uh, but there are no tricks. You know, I, I don't, you know, I have some pet dislikes. I don't like HDR photography, for example. Yeah. I, it just bothers me. Um, it's fine. If you like it, do it. But I personally don't like it. I don't really like manipulated photographs. I was looking at um, some yesterday by a photographer who's one of the Sony photographers, a Canadian woman, who does incredible landscapes. Kath Simar, I think her name is. Um, she's French Canadian. There's remarkable landscapes, but they're all heavily manipulated. And she says sometimes she spends spends a week on one image Amazing. in Photoshop. We were in Patagonia at exactly the same time, and we both escaped from Patagonia on the same day, although we didn't bump into each other. But she gets remarkable photographs, but they're not the actual scene. They're her impression of it, and yeah. that is not the kind of photography that I'm interested in doing personally. I, I respect it and I can admire it, but it's not what I want to do. I'm a, an old fashioned, I'm an old school documentary photographer. Uh, and that's what I do. I shoot what I see. Yeah. yeah. So again, classic geographic training, I guess. And we love it, Bob. It, 
it tells a story. It it's got color in it. It's got life in it. There's there's so many elements that make those your photographs work. Yeah, the only secret is learning to see. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough. If you can't see, you're never going to make great photographs. And I love color. Whenever I see color, um, I work with it. You know. Put, like the, the blue bars and the horse coming in from the left against the green wall. Yeah, that's a classic example. I saw that color combination. Oh, wow, that is that is fabulous. I now need the punctuation to make it. Yeah, here we are. I now need the punctuation to make it all come together. And lo and behold, the horse comes past and I get the shot. Boom. But yep. I'm always looking for things like that. Fantastic. Well, guys, always a pleasure to have you on. Any final thoughts or tips you'd like to leave our viewers with especially in this time keep your day job <laughs> okay now find a cause or a group or situation that you really believe in and find a way to be able to connect in community and and share that with other people i think we all keep each other inspired and moving ahead awesome well you guys stay dry up there Stay well, and we'll see you again really soon. Thanks, Mark. Okay, take see care, you guys. See you very soon. Once again, that was awesome, you guys. Hey, you know, we may have just actually sparked an idea. Maybe we can do that virt virtual workshop. I noticed a bunch of you guys chimed in there and said you'd like to do it. We'll, we'll talk it over and let you know. Uh, let's see a couple of points of news here. If you're not already in our AYP club, you should join it. Jared will put the link in there. Also, um, definitely check out the, uh, I'll put this link in here in a second, but check out Bay Photo. They have those specials going on. You guys should make a book. Okay. Put your work together. That's a great project right now. Believe me. Um, Jared, do we have anything else coming up that we need to let folks know about? Uh, I don't think so right now. I'm just putting the link here for uh, AYP Club. Uh, Virtual I know workshop. Yes, Gary likes that. Okay. Sandy mentioned, can we uh, share our pictures for critique? That is something that we have yeah. talked about doing. So if that is something you're interested in, please let us know. Um, you know, we're always looking for... You know, we want to create content that you guys are interested in. So if you ever have any suggestions on, you know, topics you want to see or different formats that you want, let us know because we're always looking for something new. Yes. And by the way, you know, that's the point of the AYP Club is you can share your work there and ask for a critique. And, you know, I interviewed a bunch of you guys and a number of you said you wanted tough love. Bob was talking about that. Not the, you know, I like it. Wow, cool. You know, that's not a critique. A critique is, a, you know, actual feedback from somebody who can tell it like it is. I mean, give you straight data. So, you know, for instance, maybe you did take a, a photograph that has a split subject, but it didn't really work. You know, Bob... Bob got it there. He nailed it. But sometimes that doesn't work. So the critique might say, hey, look, either go one way or go the other, or really take the time to make sure that you are taking each one of those frames within the frame and making them work together. Because if they don't work together, it's just going to look uh, distracting. So that's a kind of a, you know, correct, uh, uh, feedback or critique that you can learn something from. When I started in photography, my dad, who was a doctor, had a patient who was an avid photographer. His name was Father Vintner. And he, I was 12 years old. What he used to do was take my negatives and print them. And on the back of the prints, he typed his critique. And I remember these very clearly. I should actually bring these out for you guys. But they were really simple critiques. Like, Mark, what would have happened if you took one step closer to your subject? Or, you know, it's a bit uh, disjointed. Whatever it was, I'll bring them out. But they were very spot on. They were just one thing. That's the other thing. 
when you correct somebody in a critique, you can't fire like 12 things at them at once because they just get confused. Find the biggest departure and talk about that and just correct that one thing. Then they can work on it and then come back again. That's another good point. And that's in our AYP club. Keep that in mind. This morning I had an idea and I'm going to run it by you guys. You let me know what you think. <laughs> I may do this, I may not do it. I was thinking next week, possibly, uh, a live broadcast every single day. Every day, starting Monday through Sunday next week. You guys have to help me on that. If I'm going to show up every day, you guys got to show up. And I can't guarantee that I'm going to have a guest every day. You might just see me rambling on. I might, for instance, uh, take one of those episodes and do some uh, work in Lightroom just to show you kind of how my workflow is. I might talk about some of the books that have inspired me. I might pay a surprise visit to somebody we don't even have scheduled. If you guys like that idea, let me know. I'd like you to help me with it. And this is why this show works. It's because you guys contribute and you're a part of it and you're participating. Well, listen, uh, I think we've covered everything. You guys remember, you know, a couple of things. Make sure you subscribe, share, like, tell your friends, tell people about AYP. And don't forget to remember, say it with me, wherever you are in the world, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Stay well, you guys. Stay safe. Love you. And we'll see you soon.